YouTube. This is Skip. Coming to you live. Straight out of Brown Six Aquatic Kennels. And I'm very excited today as we wrap up this video series where I explain the science behind the different Amphilopus barred mitre species. In part three, we're going to wrap this thing up. We're going to bring everything to full circle. And hopefully, when you finish watching this video, you'll have a greater understanding of the science behind the different Bob Midas species, how the Bob Midas variations came about, and how to move forward in recognizing and identifying the different Bob Midas variations and subspecies. So let's get started. In part one, we went over the different species itself. We talked about the Almarillo, the Isolatus, the Heloensis, all the different types of Bob Mitre species. And I threw out a lot of words and terminology that some of you guys may not be familiar with. So in part two, I attempted to elaborate a little bit more in detail about those words and terminology so that you guys can have a greater understanding of the point that I was trying to make and get across to you guys. Now remember this, a lot of this stuff is based on my theories, but all my theories are backed by science. You can, you can fact check me. You can go back and check everything that I've said in the first two videos of this series. You can fact check it. Go on the internet, you can Google any of the terms or anything that I've said and research it for yourself and come to your own conclusion. I am definitely not saying that everything I say is etched in stone or is gold. I'm here only to give you different perspectives on certain topics so you can have options and move forward to understanding the bigger picture of what's going on with this Midas species complex. As we look at these awesome specimens. So let's jump right into part three of this video series. Skip explains the science behind different bald mitre species. Let's recap. First we looked at different bald mitre photos in part one. Then we talked about the evolutionary process that took place in the bald mitre species to create the different subspecies. Then in part two, we went over the different definitions of some of those words and terminology used in part one. So now here in part three, I am going to bring everything that we went over in part one and two full circle. Starting with why I call the mitre cichlid a super species. You see, long ago, I was researching the mitre species complex. And as I started digging deep into its genetics, I uncovered the term that is new to me, that was new to me, superspecies. So I started to research the superspecies term to see if the word 
applied to the mitre cyclic? Was it applicable to the mitre cyclic? And I found that with most terms that you use in the scientific community, loosely, that the superspecies term could, in fact, apply to the mitre cyclic. Based on my interpretation and consulting real ichthyologists and biologists about the subject. As we look at Solo here, to your left, and Sugar Bear to your right. So while we're on the subject of superspecies, which involves evolution, because the bottom line is this, people, to bring it all full circle for you, a full understanding in a nutshell, part one, part two, evolution. That's it. Evolution took place. It was evolution per se, on a fast track with this mitre species. This mitre species is the perfect example of how evolution works. Here we have a species that creates subspecies within its own genetic species complex his own family, meaning the mitre species does not have to hybridize outside of its own lineage, its own race to produce different subspecies or variants of itself. And that's why I consider this marvelous, extraordinary, incredibly awesome cichlid a super species sickly. For that very reason. Now everything I say is backed by science. I mentioned that to you before. You can go online or Wikipedia it and look up super species and study it like I have. Since I discovered the term. And trust me, you can see where I made that title that term applicable to this species here. We learn in part two that male and female of this species can produce not only fertile offspring but offspring that are fertile and different from one another. Something that hybrids does not do consistently. Most hybrids are infertile, but subspecies of the same species, 90% of those are fertile. I've never bred two different types of mitis subspecies that have not yet produce infertile offspring. All their offspring were fertile. So that's another reason why I say that hybridized term is loosely as well. It's a term that's used loosely and it's many other scientific terms that's used loosely. How can a hybrid produce over 90% fertile offspring? Something has to connect. And I told you guys, genetics is like a puzzle. And the pieces have to fit in order for them to be produced. So, before we move further, let's check out this short video clip discussing 
the evolution of fish. flexible support running the length of the body, the spine, a feature so important that without it there would be no birds, no reptiles, mammals, or humans. And upon this spine, evolution moved forward. Fins grew for steering. Some fish developed a skeleton of soft cartilage, which led to the shark and the ray. Most formed scales for protection, a swim bladder for buoyancy, and a skeleton of hard bone. For the last 100 million years, this design has been the prototype of almost every fish, including the most famous fish fossil of all, the coelacanth, thought to have died out at least 80 million years ago. But then in 1938, scientists were stunned to find the coelacanth was alive and well, living off the east coast of Africa. The only people who weren't surprised were local fishermen, who for years had used the coarse skin of the coelacanth as a roughening tool when patching the inner tubes of their bicycles. So now that we understand why we have so many Bob Midas variations, let's touch on another topic that was raised while making this video series. Let's talk about the peel Midas as it relates to the Bob Midas. Now, have you ever wondered why all the peel Midas variants? look slightly different or a lot different from one another? That's a question that came up while I was making this video series. And something interesting happened. When I bred this guy, Sugar Bear, right here coming out, this white peel Midas, which was thought to be a Saggy, like my large 13 inch Saggy, Abu, King Abu. But now that I have had him for a while now and in my possession, and had an opportunity of, to observe him closely, I feel that he's not a Saggy. And I've always had my suspicions of this fish being a Saggy, just based on his body structure alone. But last week, when these two had babies, it was confirmed for me. Because he grew a large knuckle hump. It went down now since. But he still shows remnants of that knuckle hump. And all my years of keeping Midas cichlids and, and cichlids alike, I have never witnessed a Saggy or a Zaliosa with huge knuckle humps. In fact, they don't pretty much get humps at all. I'm not saying it's not possible. What I'm saying is not the norm. The average Zaliosa and Sagittate, which is the Earl variation Midas normally do not display knuckle humps. In fact, let's take a look at my female Zalios so you can look at her body structure compared to this guy here. And then we'll take a look at my large 13 inch Saggy uh, boot who has the same 
more color markings as this guy right here before you sugar bear much bigger than sugar bear but yet his body structure is totally different Okay, now that you've seen my female Zali, take a look at my male Saggy that I was talking to you guys about. Big King of Boo. He's pushing a whopping 13 inches. And as you can see, although this this is this lighting on this aquarium is pretty bad, it's washing out his color. But you can see the orange splash through the fins, the orange around the eyes, and the propeller fin is displaying a little orange, just like Sugar Bear. But unlike Sugar Bear, King of Boo is more aerodynamic shape. You can see he probably would never have a knuckle hump. I don't know why, as I get closer to the tank, he likes to stay at the top. I guess he figured he's going to eat. And he's constantly moving. He's very aggressive. But you can see his body structure. You can tell that it's different. And plus, he's 13 inches. And that fish, Sugar Bear, body as far as height and deepness is much deeper than this fish at 13 inches and the sugar bear is pushing maybe 10 inches at best king of boo got him by at least three inches but yet his body is taller than this fish he's definitely no sag this is a sag Wasn't that female Zali awesome and that Saggy awesome? As we look at another awesome pair of peel Midas. Which begs the question, people. Should we or should we not start to investigate and classify these peel Midas? Because I'm sure at one point in time the peel variation came from a barred variation at one point in time either big or small Miss Pearl and Smoke look like these guys and in fact Miss Pearl Belly's sister is right here before you. That bar variation, Isolatus, is Miss Pearl's belly sister, meaning that she was spawn from the same batch of babies at the exact same time and date. So she's Miss Pearl's belly sister. They're direct descendants from one another. But yet, Miss Pearl here is peeled. She's peeled an orange coloration. But she's still an isolatus. I'm sure Smoke here is a peeled isolatus. I'm not 100% sure, but I can go by the body structure 
and my experience of keeping mitre cichlids for so long that I know certain characteristics that they display even when they peel. It's probably hard for some other people to tell, but I have a trained eye. 40 years experience keeping, breeding, and studying these fish to where my eye is not like the regular or average signaling keeper's eye. I can spot little telltale differences and signs in these fish that pretty much give me a clue and an idea what type of subspecies of mitis they are. But for the people who don't have a trained eye like myself, what do you do? How do you tell? Because to the average person, these two fish are peeled mitis. And in fact, this one is an orange mitis, and this one is considered a cream sickle. So, had I taken these fish and sold them to someone without telling them exactly their background, or if I didn't have a pedigree on the female here, Miss Pearl, which I don't have one on smoke, I don't know his background. And it's just my theory that he is a peel isolatus, because isolatus do peel this morph coloration too as well. And so does Heloensis, and so does Sagis. As you seen, and as we discussed, evolution in this video series. Sugar Bear here. Proud Papa. I'm proud of him. I believe he's a peel Amarello. Or Heloensis. Either or. I don't know for certain. I can't tell you that for a fact. But what I am sure of is he is not a Sagi. Okay, as we finish this video series, right before you are Smoke and Miss Pearl's offspring. These fry off of Smoke and Miss Pearl. And so I must ask the question again, aquatic community. Do we or do we not start to classify all the peel mitis species as well so that we alleviate some confusion. Because I'm sure out of this batch, 20% of these fry are not going to peel and they're going to remain barred or what have you. And just by this by visual eyesight, the average person could not tell you what type of mitis it is. They can just tell you the bar mitis, but they can't tell you what type of bar mitis it is. And that's something that has been going on for years, for decades now. And that's another reason why we have so many different variations of barred mitis in this aquatic community. And a lot of people don't even know what they're calling them or why they're calling them what they're calling them. So with that said, this skip, I hope you enjoyed this video series. I'm out.